Well, good morning or good afternoon, or if you were, I am in Shanghai, China. Good evening. Uh, I'm Scott Kennedy. I'm the trustee chair in Chinese business and economics, and I'm delighted to host uh, today's Big Data China event, which is called Chinese Imports and American Jobs, a reassessment. I am joined by a great group of experts who have been watching China's economy uh, for many years and trying to understand the implications for U.S.-China relations. And we're going to talk about a debate now which Washington is familiar with in some ways, but in some ways they have not been watching the entire debate. And that's the purpose of the project that we have with Stanford University, Big Data China, which is to give some insights into uh, how scholarship uh, using quantitative analysis speaks to questions that Washington, D.C. and the policy community cares about. And there's probably no bigger issue than the question of how has Chinese imports affected uh, jobs in the United States? And that is one, uh, again, uh, that is animating a lot of the conversation in Washington about our approach towards China. What should we do? And so we decided to take a look at this question again because we didn't think that necessarily the policy conversation had really taken all perspectives into consideration. So I'm going to put up a little bit of data right now. Uh, and after I do that, make some opening remarks. I'm going to hand things over to one of my partners in crime, Scott Rosell, who heads uh, Stanford Center on Chinese Economics and Institutions. And then he's going to introduce some of the experts who have been doing this hard work in academia. And then he's going to throw it back to me, and I'm going to introduce uh, a couple experts from Washington, D.C., who have been working on China and trade for several years uh, and are as smart as anybody on this topic. And then we're going to bring every one of you into the conversation as well. So that's the plan. So let me get started and just give a little bit of context before we turn things over to the professors. So I'm going to put up my, my slides here right now, and, and hopefully you all can, can see those. So let's see if I can do this right. I'm in Shanghai, so hopefully it still works. But hopefully you all can see all that, right? Super duper. Okay. Well, again, we're joined by a great group of people. Uh, and I really would just, this is just meant to be a scene setter for all the heavy lifting that others are going to do behind me. So I think it's probably not surprising to most of you who are watching today that imports from China to the United States have risen a lot over the last several decades, particularly since the late 1980s. And then once China joined the WTO, uh, continued to rise until uh, about 2018 or so, uh, partly because of uh, Trump era policies and then the pandemic we've had a decline uh, in imports from, from China as a share of our total imports. But you can see most of these are upward sloping lines. Everybody around the world has been importing more from China as China has become their largest trading partners by most uh, measures. At the same time that this has occurred, there's also been changes in manufacturing employment around countries around the world. Uh, we've highlighted the uh, changes in manufacturing employment in the United States, but we've got in red, but you can see the changes for others as well. Uh, that, you know, broadly speaking, uh, this is in thousands of persons, so 20 thousands of thousands is 20 millions there uh, by my political scientist, bad math. And, but you can see that overall employment uh, in manufacturing in the U.S. has dropped, and it's dropped in a, a lot of countries over time. These two slides, the increase in imports from China and the decrease in manufacturing in the United States and elsewhere, have generated concern about the relationship between those two things. And uh, Americans started about seven or eight years ago in Washington paying attention to a part of the debate uh, in 
uh, academia about uh, the effects of imports on jobs, uh, particularly by a uh, professor from MIT, David Autor, and some of his colleagues, uh, who found a significant overall job loss in the United States as a, as a consequence of these increase in imports. Uh, but what we've noticed in when we went to look back at the literature is that there was actually a very live conversation and a conversation that is not complete. In fact, there are others who have other points of view. Uh, there's some things they agree about and there's some things that they disagree about. And we've put that together in a feature which we've released today, uh, which I co-authored with my colleague at CSIS, Ilaria Mazzacco, uh, about this debate and what it may mean for how we think about policy. So the debate that these scholars have had is partly first about the question of, was there a China shock? Was there a significant loss of jobs? And for the most part, actually, they all agree. Yes, there were certain segments of the American uh, of labor force that lost jobs as part of this China shock. But they disagree on whether there was an overall net loss in employment as a result of increased trade and including imports from China. And in fact, uh, the other part participants to the debate, uh, which we show up here on the screen, thought that actually, in fact, on net, there was either uh, an overall no loss or in fact, in some areas, an increase, a net gain in employment. But it's also interesting that they have had some conversations about what was the effect over the last 10 years on employment as a result of trade with China. Um, those uh, uh, amongst Autor and his colleagues think that there's some lingering effects from the original China shock of the knots in two, between 2000 and 2007, uh, but not a massive effect, just sort of a lingering effect. Whereas the other groups of scholars have found, in fact, very little effect uh, uh, since. One thing that's also particularly interesting is that when you ask them about policy, what should the U.S. do? What would be the most effective ways to stem um, this uh, the uh, job losses? Most of them tend to focus on improving the quality of the American workforce, particularly uh, education, and that protectionist measures, including tariffs, from their perspective, seem to be most likely counterproductive. Now, of course, they don't work in Washington. They don't do trade policy, but from their academic perches and what they've looked at over time, um, those type of policies, uh, which have become more prominent in Washington, for them would be seen to be less effective than others. Now, one of the things that we did in putting together this feature was to look at Broadly speaking, what is the what was the changes in employment in the U.S. relative to the changes in imports, as and put the U.S. in comparison to a lot of other countries, which we've done in the figure here. So here you can see uh, the U.S. and a bunch of other countries uh, on this chart uh, with a line that is sort of like the median trend, and you can see that the U.S. is below that line. Uh, and also that it had a drop in manufacturing employment over that decade. So the U.S. lost jobs, uh, and it lost more than most uh, over that decade than the average. If the U.S. was at the average level, it'd be right on that line. And so one of the reasons that we thought that we ought to talk about this is because every country, as we showed before, faced a shock from China but they had different reaction levels to it. The US had a more significant amount of job losses than elsewhere. And that raises the question, is there something about the US policy reaction or the policy environment in the US with regard to its labor force that might've made it more vulnerable to a China shock than elsewhere? Finally, if we look ahead at the last decade, 2010 to 2020, you can see that there's been a gain for the U.S. in overall manufacturing, and that the U.S. is above that median line. In fact, the U.S. has gained more jobs in manufacturing than one would have expected 
relative to the change in imports from China. Now, of course, we're not holding anything constant. This is no uh, you know, scientific analysis like the economists that we're going to bring out for you in a few minutes. But what it does show is that um, we've got some interesting questions to ask about trends in employment uh, and imports and how the U.S. Uh, responded relative uh, to some other countries. Anyway, so that's the scene I wanted to set for you. That's why we were interested in, in this topic. We know it's fraught, we, but we also know it's incredibly important. So I'm delighted now to hand things over to uh, my colleague, Scott Rosell from Stanford Center on Chinese Econ Economy and Institutions, who is our partner with big, on Big Data China. He's going to take things over from here and introduce our uh, scholars who are going to talk about some of this research. Scott? Uh, thank you, Scott. And I wanted to thank uh, your staff, uh, Alari and Mazako, especially, and, and her staff for putting this together. This, as you know, has been a tough one to get organized because of the complexity of it. And um, as the director, co-director of the Stanford Center on Chinese Economy Institutions, one thing we try to do is anything that we work on jointly with CSIS and, and others is we want it to be data-based and high quality research and then try to translate that into uh, uh, what Scott just showed you, an understandable um, uh, sort of story, uh, even though that story is not, is not complicated, is, is not uncomplicated itself, be, just to raise our awareness of what's happening on these incredibly important issues. And so thank you, Scott. It, it's uh, and, and Ilaria, this has been uh, uh, a tough one to put together because it's complicated. My, my job now is just twofold. I'm going to introduce the, the two uh, first uh, speakers. And um, the first one is uh, Professor Jir Wang. Uh, he's an affiliated, uh, affiliated research faculty and senior policy fellow at the SCAR School of Policy and Government at George Mason University. He's also a professor and founding director of the Research Center of Global Value Chains. This is gonna be important for our, um, uh, our um, global value chains are important for our session today um, of the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. Uh, he worked as the lead uh, international economists at the U.S. International Trade Commission and other U.S. government agencies for more than 20 years before his current positions. He's co-editor of the 2017 and 2019 Global Value Chain uh, Development Report that was jointly published with the World Bank, with OECD, and the WTO. Uh, he's an author. He's a co-author of several books, many book chapters, and he's also my friend and colleague. We've known each other for many, many years. So that's Jir Wang. Um, and after that, <laughs> not but not least, <laughs> uh, not last but not least for, for my introductions, I want to introduce Andre Kerman. He's a professor of economics at the Drexel LeBeau College of Business. Um, he's also an associate editor of the Journal of Monetary Economics. He serves on the board of directors of the Philadelphia Reserve, uh, uh, the Philadelphia Federal Statistical Research Data Center, and he is visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Board uh, Bank of Philadelphia. Prior to joining Drexel, uh, Kerman worked as a research economist at the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, D.C. from 2011 to 2013. And for that, he was an assistant professor of, at, of finance at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania from 2008 to 2011. And before that, he was an assistant and associate professor at the economics department of the University of Quebec in Montreal. Lots of experience there. And we're really very pleased to have Andre uh, here with us today. So uh, I'm going to pass it back over to Scott. Um, sitting there in Shanghai. I'm in California, you're in Shanghai. It's early morning here, it's late night there, but at the center of the day are these guys here on our on our Zoom meeting. So uh, Scott, it's all yours. And thanks again for Super. organizing this very important. Super. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Rosell. It's a great partnership here. So I'm gonna turn things over right now to, uh, uh, to Wang Zhe, uh, who is gonna give some of his perspective about this debate. Uh, for about six or seven minutes or so. And then we're going to turn things over to Andre and get his site, his, his 
uh, reactions and thoughts about this. Uh, and then we'll um, take a breather. We're then going to go to Aunt, uh, Anna and, and Jeremy. I'll introduce them a, a fully and appropriately uh, when, when we get to that stage of the conversation. So Wang Jir, uh, yeah. thank you for joining us. And I think if you've got some slides, feel free to show those now if you'd like. Can you see my screen? Indeed, it's perfect. Okay. First, I thank Tuska, Tuska to organize this great, great event, events, give us an opportunity to uh, present our uh, research. This is a joint research with Professor Zhang Jinwei at Columbia University and the two younger scholars from China. So this work done in 2016 to uh, 2018, about two years. So basically, so we put a global supply chain perspective to this debate. So when most, most US scholars to study the impact of imports from China on US employment, uh, most of them, like the uh, uh, professor from MIT, like the author and, and Hansen from the California and uh, P. Scott from the Yale University, among others, they basically focus on the negative effects of the imports from China. Basically, it's the sum because the the import we have in the metal goods, so like the car parts, uh, like the chips. So then we have final goods like iPhone, like cars. So basically, they sum the in the metal goods and the final goods together. They ignore the potentially positive effects from imported in many inputs. So, to put the supply chain perspective, we're adding two additional force with the opposite sign science. One is upstream effects. That means the employment of US form that supply the inputs to those US form directly compete with the imports. So for example, if we import steel from China, then the US steel form will directly compete with, with, with Chinese steel forms. But uh, you see, those form in the United States supply coals, supply uh, electronic products to the steel forms will also get hard. So that's the upstream effects. But we also have a downstream effect. That means the employment in US form that use Chinese in the manual goods. So because they will lower their cost. So give them more resources to extend their production and the employment. That's where we have a positive gain for the US employment. So when you adding these two channels from supply chain perspective to into uh, uh, author and the other, uh, and the Scott's, uh, and, and the shirt, and the piece, and the purse, and the, and the fruits uh, work, the picture might be changed. So basically what we contribution here is we, we put the, both the upstream and downstream uh, effects into the analysis. We also examine for mutually exclusive outcome variables simultaneously. As I mean, you see, in a US uh, population co cohort and each commuting commun 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 zones, so we will put four shares together, not only manufacture employment. We have no manufacturer employment, especially service. We also have unemployment and uh, not in labor force. So this these four shares will sum to 100% of that, 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 that population group. So that's basically our method, different with the, uh, the others. So what is the downstream? The downstream effects is very important because a significant part of US imports from China is imported in the manual goods, inputs, which have downstream US form to improve efficiency 
and save their resource to expand their employment. Such effects are different from the direct competition channels where import merely substitutes for US dom domestic production and the employment. So if you so see this data, you say basically every seven years, the US import from China of uh, individual goods doubled. So starting from 2000, so US imports uh, is about 20-80%, less than 30% of total US import from China is about 15 billion. But to 2007, this number become 63 billion. Then to 2014, become 130 billion. It's about 30, 30-80% of total China imports from, from so then to 2021, that become 28 billion US dollars, become around 50% we import from China. You see, that's a, you see, the over 20 years, the import from China 30, less than 30%, and then increase to about half of US import from China is become in many goods. Okay, that is a very, very impressive uh, change of the import structures. So what is our main funding? Basically it's two, you say, the effects of imports from China on employment in US local labor market and the labor force by education level. First, the, the, the direct exposure produce a decline in manufacturing employment. Is, this is the same with the others the funding. The indirect effect is especially the downstream effects produce a larger opposite effects where the direct exposure reduces employment in for both college and no college educated workers. This again is overturned once the supply chain channel are taken into account. So that is basically is all the, the major funding, first major funding. The second major funding is the real wage and the different futures for the more and the less educated worker uh, is quite impressive. The college educated worker say risk in the real wage, where less educated worker experience a decline on average. However, the overall real wage bill increases as a result with trading with China. So this set of funding overturned the picture from looking the direct effects only and the manufacturer employees alone. So that's the basically our major conclusion. So then I give some details why this picture can be turned after you take into the account of supply chain perspective, because there are three different channels the U.S. imports across sector can affect U.S. production and employment. So you, you will see the, the graph in my uh, right hand, you see, you have see this by sector, the best sector, you say, by, from agriculture to all service sectors, okay? If you see the, the export stemming from the use of import inputs, is much larger, both in scale and scope than upstream and the, and the direct and exposures. You see, the direct exposure basically concentrate on manufacture sector, some on the food sector and agriculture, but very small. Then some on the wholesale and the transportation is small too. However, the upstream channel, that means, uh, for example, the import of steel, the U.S. firm provide the cause, provide the chemicals to U.S. steel firm. They are so get the effect. But you see, the scope is much larger, almost all sectors. But but still, the manufacture sector that's get the effect the most. But if it's a downstream effect, that means the U.S. firm they use China steel to make a cars, to make the buildings. So those. It's much more large and uh, large in scope and the large in effects that cover all the US, US sectors, the whole economy. 
and especially service sector, you see all the service sectors get effects. So then they, we found the job creating downstream effect to both in to be both economically and statistically significant. Much of the job extension due to the downstream channel take place outside the manufacturing sector. So we can conclude that there is no support for the notion that the US China trade during 2002. 2007 or 2014 has result in a need job loss in the local US labor market. Then people will have question why indirect downstream effects on employment can be stronger than the direct competing effects. The reason is the direct import competition, just like this graph shows, is mainly manufacturer, with the manufacturer only taking about the 12 to 15 percent, or even most is 20 percent of US total employment. Where downstream exposure is prevalent in all sectors in the US economy, in kind of the service sectors, even research institutions, hospitals, schools, banks, law firms, government departments, and the rest rest restaurants use imported Chinese made laptops, desktop. Uh, desktop computers, electronic cables, communications device, steel pass, table and chairs, light bumbles, bed sheets, uniforms, or wash towers, everything, okay, everything, you want everything you import from China. This is true, not only for economic as a whole, but also for vast majority of local labor market. This can explain why downstream employment create the creation can more than offset the employment loss in upstream and directly export industries within the same local labor market. So it is a key factor behind the strong growth in US no manufacturing employment due to the trade with China. So that's the insight. Then you see the two pictures. The, that is uh, US with, we started the US labor market to 722 commuting zones. That's the same with the with the author the, and other authors. You see, you, using the same data, you will see when you only consider the direct competition exposures, that's direct final goods, especially final goods from China, you see they really have a downline trend. You see, the, the, the scatter plot is a down, down, downward, downward loss, you see. You see, the horizontal horizontal access is the direct import effect. Then the horizontal is the actually employed chain in percent in percentage points. You see, that's done done. But after we consider the two double chain effects, you see, we, we not only take the direct impact, we also take the downstream and upstream effects, you will see. They become an uptrend. But in most local labor market, they actually have a small positive gains for US employment. That's our econometric results. Then if you see this graph is a all US workers are grouped into 20 groups according to their initial income level. The overall effect of importing from China. But summing over the through cha three channels, the, the direct compete, the upstream effect, and the downstream effect. Then we sum them together, plot out of it together with a 95 confidential band. We see, you see, the 20 groups, the five group is below the zero. That means they get a negative shot. Their, their, their income is lower than initial. That's 25 percent. Then the rest of 15 groups, that's 70 percent of the U.S. workers, the real weekly wage accuracy, accuracy is increased, especially for the high income groups. This is over about less little less than 10 percent. But most of them uh, of the labor is about 5 percent increase in real wage. So for comparison, if we only plot the effects of the wage distribution, when we only look at the direct competing effects, 
So we labeled as ABH, that's the three professor conducted the initial study of China shark. You will see all the 20 group of workers from the low income to high income or loss. So that means you don't take into account the supply chain perspective. You cannot find only actually 25% the work for workers, their real wage is declined. But the other 75 actually increase risk. So that's the really make a difference when you consider the, the supply chain perspective. So if you don't come, don't include the supply chain perspective, we have the same results with the ADH. Okay. Hi, terrific. Wangju. Okay. Uh, just, just in the name of uh, time, because we, we want to make sure we give everyone okay. a chance to okay. uh, speak. So this is the final slide. As yeah. you can okay. see, the distribution of the, the geographic distribution of the impact of importing from China. You see, all the West, the Pacific and the mountain, they, they gain the most. So the, the, the less the color, the benefit, the employment benefit from China imports is less. You will see the most benefit region for US is the Pacific region and the mountain region. Then the most less, they get a little, very little gain or even no gains is for the Middle East, Middle East. Okay, that's the, the, the uh, in some extent that you say the, the East Coast also gains, but the light, much less. So that's basically my presentation. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And that's, that's given everybody a short course in the, the basic data. You could bring your slides down if you'd like. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Actually, sure, actually, thank you so small, much. Small okay. No worries at all. So I want to give uh, Andre uh, Kerman now a, a chance to offer some of his reactions. Um, Andre, as you've seen, uh, Wangjer's slides emphasize the importance of indirect effects on uh, intermediate trade and intermediate goods and uh, downstream sectors. And I was, we'd look forward to seeing how the work that you and your other colleagues have done have aligned or maybe have some areas of differences uh, with Wang Jers and, and the others in this community. And just uh, just if you would, so that we give enough chance to um, uh, the other speakers and the conversation that we definitely want to have, uh, if you could be as, as, as brief as possible. Thanks so much. Over to you. Thank you very much, Scott. Yes, I'm going to uh, abbreviate my presentation a little bit to leave time for uh presenters given where we are right now. Thank you. So yes, this is a uh, work together with Nick Plume, Kyle Handley, and Phil Locke that we have uh, conducted over the last few years. And uh, um, I don't think I have to say much uh, to set the stage here. Uh, a number of uh, prominent researchers have found that the China shock, what we call it, is, is in uh, a spectacular rise in imports of Chinese manufacturing goods to the US has exerted a large negative effect on US manufacturing employment. And I think what resonated most with people, even outside the economics profession, was that uh, Auditor and Hansen showed how, uh, according to the results, these, these, these effects, these negative effects were concentrated in, in the heartland of, of the US, where, um, uh, where, where they uh, found very large negative effects um, and, and, and they, they had very uh, they had other uh, negative um, consequences too, say for political polarization, uh, deaths of despairs, um, and, and so forth. Now, our point that we make is that, well, at the same time as this China shock happened, um, there was also a large reorganization of production and employment towards non-manufacturing. Uh, and that, that certainly joins uh, with what Ji Wang uh, said before. And our uh, question then is simply, well, are the two related? And if so, is Chinese trade really so dam damaging and for whom? And sort of to, to, um, to give you an example here, this is from an article from the Wall Street Journal uh, that has a very fr a nice phrase, uh, which is, the, uh, it says, the phrase on the back of iPhones designed by Apple in California, assembled in China, highlights a key reason for the company's remarkable success. So the idea that Chinese rise as a manufacturing power enabled, in fact, US firms to enter into new product markets, which then benefited the US overall. Uh, that, that's sort of an interesting question, and that's one we try uh, to assess. So 
I don't want to go into the technical details of we, what we do. We are uh, trying very much to follow earlier research, say by Otter, Dorn and Hansen, uh, where we look at the exposure of local labor markets or industries as well to uh, the rise in Chinese imports called Chinese import penetration. The thing we do that's different from all of this research is that we are using confidential census microdata. And I don't want to bore you with the details here, but one thing that's really important about this is that you can look at actual uh, plants and the firms who own these plants. And you can see, therefore, the details on how firms restructure within plants, across plants and across regions. Um, and and that's, that's really an important, that gives you important insights. Our data also affords us a better industry definition. So in terms of using, in, instead of using SIC codes, which are uh, old industry uh, codes, we can use NAICS codes and we have more accurate data. And the point I wanna make here is simply that these measurement issues, they are not sexy in any way. You have, this is hard stuff, but they turn out to matter quite a bit. And the main reason why our results are, are different from Otter Dorn Hansen is not because we look at downstream versus upstream, it's simply because when you use these industry definitions from NAICS, it turns out you get different results and, and it's somewhat for good reasons. And I'm happy to talk about this uh, later if anyone is interested. Okay. So just to give you a picture of, of, of um, what Order Dorn Hansen emphasized, which we also find uh, at first sight at least, is that when you look at local labor markets, uh, which are called commuting zones, uh, the heaviest impact of this China shock in terms of exposure to Chinese imports was in the heartland uh, as seen by red and orange here. But uh, you can also see that uh, on the coast, there are local labor markets that were affected quite a bit. Now, the important thing is that this graph is hiding uh, uh, the point that most of the population actually doesn't live in these red areas. In fact, if you, um, if you uh, look at um, where most of the population and therefore employment is in the US, well, it turns out that 125, uh, 124 or about 17% of these commuting zones, they account for 75% of population. And so you really need to see what's happening in these commuting zones to see what on average happens uh, uh, as an effect of Chinese import uh, penetration on US labor markets. Okay, And what's even more interesting is that, well, if you focus on the 40th biggest commuting zones, so these are big cities, you see some really interesting things. You see, for instance, that the city that was most affected by Chinese imports in terms of how much manufacturing they had going on prior to these imports, is San Jose, which includes Silicon Valley. Definitely not an area that you associate with uh, empty manufacturing plants and generally depressed labor markets. And so this is the background on which uh, we, we want to uh, show you now here a few results um, based on our stochastical, uh, sorry, statistical analysis. Um, what we find is that as Otto Dorn Hansen and other people have found, we find that these uh, Chinese imports they did have negative effects on uh, local manufacturing jobs on average, but they're, ups they're upset by local non-manufacturing job gains on average. And most of these effects are concentrated in the late 1990s, early 2000s. There's no significant effect after 2010. Okay. Now, when you go in and we heard the word heterogeneity earlier on when we had our pre-meet, what's What's happening here on average really hides a lot of differences among different local labor markets. In particular, labor markets that have a relatively educated population, they saw small manufacturing job losses. In fact, most or 50% of these job losses came from plants that moved from manufacturing industries to non-manufacturing, R&D, wholesale management. And you see on average, large non-manufacturing job gains. On the other hand, in local labor markets where education is relatively low, there are large manufacturing job losses, mainly plant shrinkage and closure, little non-manufacturing job gains. And to kind of uh, give you a picture of this, this is consistent with the coast versus heartland story um, that uh, in, uh, in other contexts is, is, uh, is often brought forward, meaning there are places where uh, non manufacturing where manufacturing jobs disappeared, where nothing else uh, replaced it. But you also have places like San Jose, for instance, or Portland, but also Providence on the other side of the United States, where the economy is thriving. And why is it thriving? Well, they did have quite a bit of manufacturing and some of that manufacturing disappeared, but it was replaced 
by non-manufacturing shops. Think of the Apple's headquarters in San Jose or Nike's headquarters in Portland. They both um, uh, employ more than 10,000 uh, employees uh, each. Most of their manufacturing is abroad, mainly in China, but the design R&D management, that's all done in the US. And so they may benefit, and this still goes back to Shivam's point, they may benefit a lot from having intermediates that they uh, can use in US markets, okay? Now, digging a little bit deeper, and, uh, and I'm always done here, is that what's going on when you look at the actual firms and plants that are owned by these firms is that it's large importing firms that reorganize towards services that account for much of the negative manufacturing effect. So this is very much consistent with what we already heard. These are the firms that use these imports downstream and benefit from cheaper imports from China, okay? And finally, we dig more into what's happening to workers in manufacturing. And we see that on average, look, manufacturing workers, they have suffered from this. They were not the beneficiaries. Non-manufacturing workers, that's another story. They benefited, and so did large firms. They are just doing fine, okay? So uh, in conclusion, our results offer what we think is a revisionist story of Chinese impact on US labor market that we call the good, the bad, and the debatable. Uh, on the good side, there's definitely a positive effect on non-manufacturing employment that we find. This is different from Audit on Hansen. It has a lot to do with methodology and measurement, okay? This, Good effect happens mostly in high human capital areas. The bad is reduced manufacturing employment, particularly in low human capital areas. And then the debatable as well, it's not so clear whether the negative effect um, uh, is, or whether there's a negative effect on residents who lived in the areas where the shock happens, even though jobs are more plentiful. Uh, that could very well be that even in these areas, right, there are some losers. And finally, um, well, this, China's, uh, this China shock could be a potential driver of the rise of superstar firms, um, more monopoly power by these firms, therefore, which is a big concern, as well as regional inequality, which is obviously a, a point that Auditor and Hansen emphasized, and that, that is an important point. And so with this, I'm going to give it back to Scott. Um, thank Thanks. you very much. And sure, I'm sure. take any questions later on, so let me understand. Okay, Andre. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to uh, Wangjer as well. Um, I think what we see from the presentations that have just been made and the points earlier is what you've witnessed is how academic debates occur and how they evolve. And that there's original piece of research uh, that uh, grabs a lot of attention. There's a lot to it that's very valuable, but it then generates others to follow up and ask questions about that original research. And as you saw, uh, with Andre right there, he basically tried a very similar approach, but different types of methodology, slightly different definitions, get a different outcome. And then you see the work from Wang Zhu and his colleagues. And what they did is, is tried to measure some other things which weren't measured in the first debate. Uh, and actually, even though they come out with different conclusions, when they're looking at the same things, they aren't that different. It's just they em end up emphasizing things. So what you see is, uh, there are there were winners and losers, all right? And you can focus on one or the other or both. And of course, when you're sitting in Washington, you want to see the whole picture as as well. And that um, when there are mixed effects uh, and there are some that don't do as well, um, there's consequences, uh, uh, significant consequences as, as we have seen. So I want to turn now to those who understand consequences better than just about anybody. Uh, and that's Anna Ashton and Jeremy Waterman. Let me introduce both of them for everybody. Anna Ashton is Director of China Corporate Affairs and U.S.-China Analysis at the Eurasia Group. Anna examines the business implications of policy developments in China and U.S. policy responses to China. Prior to joining the Eurasia Group, Anna served as a senior fellow at the Asia Society Policy Institute and was Vice President of Government Affairs for the U.S.-China Business Council. Uh, she is a rock star in Washington, D.C., and we are delighted to have you here this, mor this morning or evening or afternoon. Anna, great to see you. Great to see you, too. All right. And then uh, joining her in this conversation now is Jeremy Waterman, who is president of the China Center and vice president for Greater China at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I've also known Jeremy for several years. He is responsible for developing and executing the Chamber's policy initiatives with regard to China, 
Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Mongolia, as well as steering the chamber's policy work in the Asia Pacific region more generally. Uh, I think there's probably not a single person I can think of in Washington, D.C. who knows more about Chinese economic policy and the U.S.-China tug of war over the last two decades than Jeremy Waterman. Uh, I am delighted that he has been able to take time uh, to be with us this morning or afternoon or evening. Jeremy, how are you? I'm well, Scott. Uh, very, very kind in introduction and no place to go here but down, I guess, after that. So great to be with this group. Thank you. Well, uh, I I think you're going to both do fantastic and, and add a lot of light and analysis to this uh, conversation. Let me let me start with with. Uh, Anna first, uh, and then I'll turn to you, Jeremy. It's a similar question to both of you. But, you know, again, I understand that you all weren't playing and ana analyzing the statistical data sets uh, that these scholars have, but you've worked in Washington for quite some time on U.S.-China trade issues. This is not a new debate to you. And I was just curious, Anna, how does the conversation that we've just had and that we have in the feature resonate with you based on just your daily working in Washington and what you've seen and how the conversation has unfolded in DC over the last uh, few years with regard to this question? Sure, so I think um, number one, it really underscores the fact that angst over negative impacts of, of China trade for US workers, while not the only or even necessarily the biggest issue driving US China policy right now really is kind of, it's the most formative um, and fundamental issue that underlies the problems in the relationship. Um, and it, it harkens back to the 2016 campaign, the presidential campaign, where both candidates really honed in on this. Um, Clinton saying that, you know, China engaged in underhanded and unfair trade practices that had hurt America's middle class and that they'd had to pay the price for it and Trump saying that China uh, raped the United States and carried out the greatest jobs theft in history. Um, you know, I think that, that that remains the core issue driving a lot of American sentiment about China and as a result, also American policy. Um, it certainly helps to account to all of the findings here for the differences in perspective between, for instance, US multinational corporations and uh, you know, heartland American workers when it comes to assessing the costs and benefits of trade with China, because the effects are clearly complex. On the one hand, more affordable goods um, and higher standard of living as a result. On the other hand, uh, big pockets of the country, especially in the heartland, that uh, watched their jobs go away um, and really didn't get did, really didn't get a return of those jobs in, in any appreciable way. Uh, and I think that, that that has translated to tensions in U.S. domestic politics um, between American working class voters in the heartland and then coastal educated elites, which seems to be reflected in this research. Um, and then that in turn lends itself to pretty simplistic rhetoric and policy proposals that are fundamentally protectionist and may in the short term mollify segments of America that feel most injured, but may not actually fix the problem. So I, I thought that the education and training emphasis when it came to recommendations uh, for, for trying to address these problems was uh, not surprising. But I also think that it's going to be a complex, uh, it will require complex solutions because um, it doesn't, it doesn't help to simply improve education uh, if, if that doesn't help the current workforce. And also greater education and skills don't necessarily translate to a motivation to migrate from hometown regions to coastal regions. Uh, we really need solutions that fix economic development disparities between regions uh, so that there's not so much of a disparity in terms of uh, an American's odds of accessing competitive skills and gainful employment based on where they're born. I think I'll stop there. That's super helpful. Uh, Jeremy, you've been at the chamber for a while. I think you also had some time at the US-China Business Council and other parts of, of you know, you, you've got rich experience and you've watched up close a lot of 
uh, the battles between the U.S. and China over industrial policy and in in general and in different industries. And there is that, you know, sort of a sense of, of unfairness uh, that um, underpins a lot of the American conversation about China, and of course, with many, many of China's trading partners as well. And that seems to also have an effect on how we think about jobs and trade with China. And I was wondering maybe if you could give people a little bit more perspective on not necessarily just the jobs part of things, but how uh, people, how Chinese industrial policy or the way they've managed their economy has affected how Washington, D.C. thinks about the relationship between the U.S. and China. Great, Scott. And, and again, great to be part of this group. But let me just commend you first, um, you know, for your efforts together with the other panelists to promote uh, data-driven analysis uh, and data-driven policymaking, because that's really important. <laughs> um, also, let me just commend the opportunity, I think, uh, to take a look back um, at what the data shows or what different sets of data, different sets of analysis show, uh, you know, and, and, and as well as to look at the, the history of what happened and, in essence, to try to answer the question, uh, how did we get here? Um, I will say as well, I, I agree with with pretty much all of what Anna, uh, Anna said, but let me make um, let me make three points, um, you know, uh, on the policy making side with um, with some um, reflections on history. And, and again, I'm speaking here not really as a in my chamber capacity, uh, notwithstanding my background. Uh, really, I'm speaking for myself as a student and, and as an observer of what's gone on over the last 20 years in the US-China relationship. Um, and I think, you know, what's most important, I, I, look, we can debate, um, you know, whether uh, the shock was inevitable or preventable. Uh, we can debate the mix of jobs between manufacturing and services. Uh, we can debate whether the benefits outweighed the costs. And I think from the perspective of the, of the business community, certainly the benefits for the economy overall uh, outweighed the costs. Uh, I think in that regard, the business community would probably side more with the, with the views put forward by Andre and uh, Bloom Hanley, you know, that that team. Uh, we can also debate the duration and the nature of the legacy. I think these are all important questions. Um, and, and in no way do I minimize, um, uh, you know, the, the data, the, 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 the different analyses that have been put forward, which all have merit. I think, but the bottom line in terms of policy making, uh, I think, and, and our politics is that there was a significant shock. There was a significant shock tied uh, to the U.S. economy stemming from China's uh, entry into the WTO. Th that shock actually began to manifest before. Um, and, and what's also important to note is that shock had speed and force behind it, particularly the speed. And if you look at, uh, um, by contrast, you know, what happened when Mexico joined the WTO, what happened when Japan joined the WTO. Uh, it took it took uh, it, more than 10 years, uh, I think over 12 years, I think, or, or around 12 years <clears throat> to see the same kinds of impacts. So spread over a much longer period of time, whereas the kinds of impacts we saw from China manifested over a much shorter period, over four years. But the bottom line is there was a significant shock and it was rapid, I think, by historical standards. Uh, I also think, you know, your comment just, Scott, on winners and losers, really important to keep in mind. Um, I think fair to say as well, looking back, that policymaking, and hindsight's always 2020, but policymaking was slow to address the concerns, uh, both in terms of trying to address uh, the distortions emanating from China and the Chinese model, um, and, uh, and to support workers who were adversely impacted by those distortions. Uh, I'm not a TAA or a labor expert, but uh, I think probably we've all taken notes of former comments from uh, Bush administration, Bush 43 uh, officials uh, at the Treasury Department, uh, comments from Fed Chairman Greenspan, uh, former Fed Chairman, that they misjudged the speed of the China shock. And, and the government did not have the support mechanisms in place uh, at the time to effectively respond to the shock. Um, on the distortions, because Scott, you asked about industrial policy, uh, I can certainly recall uh, fairly vividly, you know, the gathering discussion in the Congress starting in about 2004, 2005, and running through the financial crisis about the about uh, about the value of China's currency, right? And there were very there was legislation put forward, 
Uh, it was it was a highly politicized issue. Um, you saw Senator Schumer and Graham, as I recall, in the Senate, and and some of you may remember Don Manzullo, that name from Illinois, uh, um, in the House. Um, there were also very intense debates about uh, whether you use Section 421. This was the product specific safeguard uh, that was uh, negotiated as part of China's accession to the WTO. Uh, Bush 43 turned down all of those import search cases brought by U.S. companies. And President Obama approved uh, only one, and neither uh, self-initiated any cases. Now, I'm not judging whether I'm not going to make a judgment here as to whether they were right, but I think if you were um, in in one of those places that was adversely affected uh, by a surge uh, of Chinese imports, and you saw the government not responding, um, for example, I, I think that could, at a minimum, fuel a perception uh, uh, that the government is not responsive. Um, I think you also had intense, but rather inconsequential discussions during this period over China's steel overcapacity and over uh, uh, on overcapacity in other areas. I can recall my good friend Tim Stratford, who was then ouster for US uh, ouster for China, USTR leading those discussions. You, this was also a period of <coughs> JCCTs and SNEDs and and then later SEDs, um, which I think you know many have characterized as uh, obviously very uh, uh, endless, uh, a very resource intensive dialogues that really failed. Those outcomes did, I want to be clear, did produce outcomes uh, um, for certain segments of the business community um, that were helpful to the U.S. economy, that were helpful to U.S. competitiveness. But in many respects, they did not produce the kinds of outcomes that were needed to address the, the specifics of this shock. I think we also need to factor in as we look to 09, you know, the financial crisis, uh, um, you know, um, that arguably compounded the shock for certain communities. So if we're thinking about legacy, um, how do we how do we assess that? Uh, I think maybe there's further research needed as to how China's response um, uh, uh, to, to the to the uh, financial crisis perhaps exacerbated uh, overcapacity in China, uh, overcapacity in China in certain sectors with with Im impacts, not just in the trade space, but in terms of global competitiveness uh, for US companies and, and exporters. Um, so specific, what am I thinking about specifically? Impacts on global prices. And how did the global price impact the ability of US manufacturers to export globally? Uh, Chinese subsidies in certain areas in wind and in telecom equipment and aluminum and, and solar made it far more difficult for US companies to compete, not just at home, but in tapping markets externally, right? And what did that do to U.S. manufacturing? And of course, other issues like IP theft uh, during that period. Uh, we're now in an era that's much more focused on uh, on patents and know-how, but, but this was a period of trademark and copyright theft that arguably synergized with subsidies to make China more competitive globally and erode the export base, I think, of certain U.S. companies. Uh, Transshipping, another issue that we see in the solar uh, case, um, let me let me turn just my third point, how the shock impacted our politics. Um, and, and I think while the direct shock that is the subject of all of these analysis ended around 2010, there seems to be reasonable consensus on that point. I think it is also fair to say that the legacy and ongoing impacts of other Chinese uh, distortionary policies did not. Um, I think it's also fair to say when we look at President Obama's pause on trade during his first term, that pause was in response to declining support uh, for trade among key constituency, key constituents, key constituencies in the Democratic Party, as well as a growing number of Republicans. And so we were already seeing a breakdown in this period of traditional blocks on trade, with Democrats opposed to trade and are supporting trade traditionally. Uh, obviously, we're in a very different universe now on that issue. And I think there's probably, uh, a, a, again, uh, a, some correlation to the shock. Um, similarly, I think the trials, you know, if, if, if we look at, you know, TPP and the trials and tribulations of efforts to both craft and pass the Trans-Pacific Partnership, on some, on, on some level, for example, I think we can, we can look at the legacy of the SOE chapter, um, which was first put forward in the TPP and is now uh, a part and parcel of every trade agreement that the U.S. has done uh, uh, with the, the agreement with Japan, the revised NAFTA, and so forth. All of that came that came actually out of the business community. And I think probably also has some roots in the shock as well when we think about industrial policy. 
and has covered the 2016 presidential election. I would just note in 2016, uh, uh, President Trump won 89 of the 100 counties most affected by competition from China, uh, in the, uh, uh, and, and, and Bernie Sanders won Democratic primaries in 64 of the 100 most exposed uh, counties in North, northern and midwestern states. And so um, I'll, I'll leave it there um, uh, and look forward to further discussion. Ah, tour de force, really rock star. You both are great. So I, 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 I've got some questions uh, about policy that I want to come back to in just a second for all of you. But I want to go back to Andre and, and Wangjer for a second, because you both have done this academic research and you show on balance net job gains in different sectors. Uh, Wangjer talks about, you know, the effects on manufacturing was 15 to 20 percent of the economy. But if you look at downstream, 80 percent of employment what you've just heard is the political reality check of Washington, D.C. Is it frustrating as an economist working on this kind of data to feel like, well, on net, there was a, you know, job gains and, and shouldn't Washington focus on the net result as opposed to both the winners and the losers? Do you feel, um, how, how does how does the Washington conversation make you think about your own academic research. Maybe we'll start with Andre and then go to Wangjer. So short answer, no, I don't find it frustrating at all. I think uh, what I see in, in politics as a reflection of this big shock is in fact very much in line with, with the research. There are big losers, Anna talked about them before, right? And there's, there's winners. The losers are very specific. Right. When someone loses a job in a, in, a, in a small town somewhere in the middle of Pennsylvania, loses a factory and there's nothing else afterwards, that's very tangible. The benefits for consumers and voters of having cheaper goods that are made in China, they're less tangible. Right? It's not clear whether Apple would have created an iPhone, say, if they wouldn't have been able to manufacture it in China. Right. And so I, I totally understand um, these these concerns, these consequences. Um, I think in many ways, our research simply confirms what people has, have already as a gut feeling, okay? And I think the only thing that may be frustrating a little bit is that the US lags terribly behind in terms of educating its workforce to prepare it for that global environment. If you compare it to say another big manufacturing powerhouse such as Germany, these are worlds apart and the US is badly, badly failing on education. That's very helpful. Hey, Wangjer, what's your reaction to the Washington so, conversation? So I think the, the problem, just like Andrew address, I'm fully agree with him. Basically you see the, 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 the direct competing effect is tangible and concentrated in particular population group and the particular region. But the benefit is a widespread, you see, and uh, it's not so, you see, if one uh, high school education workers lost their manufacturing job, they're not able to enjoy the middle class lifestyle. However, you see, the, the, the Chinese import, uh, the textile import from, Ch from China is cheaper. But you see, for the high income group, you see, a, 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 a suit cheap for $20. Even expensive $20 doesn't matter. So that's the issue. So it's very difficult to solve, you see, because the dynamic effect is concentrated. It's better like the, uh, like Jeremy said, because you the China, the, China's emergency is in a very short time than Japan, than, than, than Asia uh, smart drugs. But our government didn't prepare this so quickly. They, when China joined WTO, you see, that time I was in working uh, in USITG, I did a study to assess, say, Clinton administration in order to pass Congress, they said the US deficit will decrease. But our projection actually is definitely very increase. But you see, because political reasons, they don't want us to highlight 
those kind of signs. They put a very minor place in the report. They mentioned the report. They didn't delete the facts. But if you check, we check our report on China accession effect on U.S. trade, we predict the U.S.-China deficit will further increase over the time. But you see, for political correctness, they they don't that time don't want these things to come out. You see, they, so that's a, you see. I believe it's very unfortunate right now. They, they, this China shock increases the division of the two parties. They popularized. So I remember when I just come to the United States in the 80s, I watched the debate between the old Bush and the Clinton. So I will admire American's political system. But right now, the admire right now is much more reduced. It's especially the January 6th. Okay, it's become a, a third country, it's a third world country. It's really sad, I say. No any compromise can be made. So so I really have thought right now what is the right path for American society. It's really difficult right now. It's no leader. All our leaders over 18, 80 years old. Biden, McDonald, and the, and the Pelosi, all is over 80s. So I hope we can elect some younger people. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Sorry. We're getting into some issues, which I wasn't really expecting us to talk about today, but I'm glad that everyone is, is, um, is, is freely sharing their views on lots of things. We've had some good questions come in, and I'm going to try and bring some of those questions that we've received from the audience to the last big question because we're we're getting close to time and i want to i want to talk about what we should be doing policy wise going forward uh, the conversation of, of an analysis about jobs looking backward thinks about a world where you've got factories and assembly lines and certain kinds of jobs that people have for many years in their careers and then uh, and and then may not have but the 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 structure of our economy now the type of industries that are increasingly important to employment to economic growth are different than they were 20 years ago when we started increasing trade with china uh we've got a, a very different type of 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 need uh in our workforce um and so I'm just curious if you all might identify, you know, what should be the top two or three things that we really should focus on to address trying to help uh, the American economy uh, and the American workforce? Is it about education? If so, what kind of education? Is it about retraining? What kind of retraining programs work well? Is it about industrial policy? It seems 2022 is the year of industrial policy in, in Washington, D.C. Are there other things that folks are not talking about, which they should be talking about, to have what the Biden administration calls a worker-centered trade policy? Let me start with Jeremy Waterman, who knows as much about how to get things done well mm -hmm. as anybody. Jeremy, what's your where, where should well, the priorities? They're, they're be? really good question. Really good question, Scott. Uh, some of it is, um, you know, beyond uh, a little bit beyond my purview uh, as a as a China and a trade analyst. But I'll I'll, I'll take a, a couple. Of, obviously, look, there's a consensus here on education, and I think um, uh, I think everybody. Um, believes we need to do a better job with our educational system particularly in the stem area and training workers uh, for for you know for the jobs of the future uh, as we look toward the future of, of with ai i think there's also um you know when it comes to to also you know we, you talked about industrial policy obviously there have been three big pieces of legislation the infrastructure bill uh the chips and science act and then the inflation reduction act um, Obviously, we need workers to, to execute <laughs> on all three. Um, you know, uh, and again, I'm you know uh, uh, there was support in the business, strong support in the business community for the infrastructure bill, strong support for the Chips and Science Act, uh, and I would say 
much less support um, uh, for the Inflation Reduction Act, even as certain industries uh, did support, uh, certain segments of business did support the Inflation Reduction Act. But the bottom line is we're going to need effective um, programs to ensure we have uh, the right kinds of employees to fill the jobs that are going to, to that are going to that are that are needed to execute on, on these policies as well as future policies that that we're probably going to need to compete and to continue to innovate um you know i think one one thing that you did not mention is trade <laughs> um you know um i i would just know for everyone um that uh that i think the concluding section of of, of the piece um I think would benefit by recognizing that Autor et al. explicitly did not call for protectionism and an abandonment of trade agreements. In fact, on the contrary, they called for the U.S. to join TPP. Um, and so, you know, and, and if you don't want to read the full study, you can just take a look at their 2015 Washington Post op-ed uh, entitled Obama's key trade deal with Asia would actually be good for American workers. So I think that's that's something else we, we need to get back in the game um, um, as we're uh, running faster domestically, investing in ourselves, uh, but we also need to compete globally uh, because the U.S. as a market of, of uh, you know, 250 million, 300 million uh, um, is is obviously a very small portion uh, uh, of the global economy, and and we need to be out there competing vigorously. And, and the last thing, I obviously things like vocational training, TAA is a complicated issue. I mean, we could have a long conversation about TAA. Uh, clearly, there's a need to make sure when there is dislocation, we have the right kinds of, of programs in place, but there's a lot of duplication, a lot of waste. And I think when you look at um, you know, the current uh, TAA um, uh, actual with, with, with the participation rate or the participation numbers in TAA, um, what I was able to come up with um, you know that 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 has declined by nearly 90% in the past decade with only roughly you know 21,000 and change uh people or individuals uh 21,200 roughly in FY21 for the Department of Labor and in a private sector market a labor market of nearly 130 million that's not many people um and so um i think you know there's there's more reflection that needs to be done there as well as in the many other programs uh you know there, there are quite a number of other federal government programs i think the u.s government invests 43 uh, excuse me 14 billion in other work workforce training programs but a gao uh, report found considerable duplication uh um, and waste in those programs so again a lot of work to be done you know in all areas i would say scott thank you very much jeremy anna what's your top priorities okay i will um some of this echoes what Jeremy said, he made a lot of good recommendations, but I'll, I'll focus on just one, and it's a structural recommendation. Um, coming from a background that included some state level economic development work for a small Southern state uh, without massive ports or airports, solving workforce readiness challenges and job accessibility challenges requires greater federal intervention. Uh, we don't just need to fix trade adjustment assistance. There's broader work we could do in terms of developing and implementing national level strategy and direction. Um, Scott, as you note, there's enormous enthusiasm for industrial policy solutions these days in Washington on both sides of the aisle. I would argue this is where industrial policy could be really useful, basically ensuring prioritization of attention and funding focused on domestic strategies for making our economy and our workforce competitive and robust. National strategy um, would also ameliorate the, the tendency for states to compete against each other rather than working together to attract job creating investments and to justify outlays for worker training. This is the longstanding paradigm for US economic development, this, this state level competition. Um, and it's inherently anti competitive to borrow a trade term because all states don't have equal advantages or budgets. And it means that the least privileges, privileged communities hurt the most by globalization are um, having to compete on this unlevel playing field with the most advantaged communities. Uh, and that's just not a recipe for success. It doesn't give them a fighting chance. Well, very helpful. I wanna to turn to our two academics who are with us uh, because what you've just heard from uh, Jeremy and Anna is that we need activist policy in Washington to address uh, 
this challenge from a number of ways and not just simply let the free hand of the market just decide winners and losers, that there's a lot more to, that Washington can do. We are not just going to sit on our hands. So, uh, Wang Zhu, um, how does that sound like a pol- does that sound like a good policy recipe for you? I think so. You see, the 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 the, the, the you see, even we study economics, we we support free trade, but also you see, the market have failures. So like those things, you have to do, government have to involve to solve the market failures. You see, because you say the transfer between losers and the owners never happen automatically. The government has to be involved. So that's a fully agree. <laughs> All right. Andre, you're going to get the last word here uh, in terms of your uh, thoughts about uh, where we're, we should go in terms of policy. Yeah, uh, I I can only second what what we've heard. Maybe the one thing I will add, two things. Sorry, is the tariffs right now that are on Chinese imports. I I don't think they're productive. They may be a bargaining token, but they're not productive in terms of solving problems uh, with uh, low manufacturing employment. Uh, um, and the second thing I would say is that. We have everyone agrees that education is really important, but no one has an idea what works. And I think we should be very humble. We should try to experiment. We should try to see what different interventions can do. Federal interventions at the local level. I am very much in favor. Let's see what different programs, maybe started at a small scale, can bring. And then we can scale them up afterwards instead of going into one big program where we don't know what the outcomes are going to be. It's a very complex problem and we should be humble about it. Thank you. Oh, Scott, I have one uh, one supplement comments. Okay. okay. So we should have the license, you say, is one trend cover another trend. So during the 20, early 20s, we're trying to introduce China into WTO. So like I did a study for, for the Congress, okay? We, our model projected the uh, uh, Oh, uh, China joined WTO will increase U.S. debt deficit. That's what mean when you assess a benefit activities, you have to say the the the, the offside. But right now, same dominant trend is the bad thing trade trade with China. Everything's negative. I think that dominant the political environment in in DC. I think your organization, you uh, you organize this panel. You say trade with China have a lot of positive things. We cannot overlook this. We don't, just like we didn't prepare well for joint WTO because we didn't overlook the, the Soviet shock because China so quickly emerged. We didn't prepare. We know that's general is a positive thing, but we didn't prepare well. But this time, at this, you say basically we just say everything is negative with China. That's not true. It's not true. We have to see. Okay? We have to stand to, to the tide. We have to speak what we we what the facts are. So yes. to let the congressman, let the senate, senate senator and our administration understand we cannot overturn the 50 years contact with China. So that's well, my I appreciate that. And this has been a, a fascinating conversation. I actually am surprised by the amount of consensus that we've had uh, today. I was expecting uh, more differences of opinion, but it's heartening to see uh, that a lot of the research, uh, because they focus on different things, uh, looks in some ways like they have different conclusions, and they do, but actually there's lots of areas of consensus in the work. And I think what it shows is that there are mixed effects from trade, right? Uh, Winners and losers. And uh, that uh, also that uh, while China prepared to join the WTO, we didn't prepare for China to join the WTO. There was a lot of things that we could have done to have been better ready for what the effect would have been on our economy. Uh, But now, uh, having had that experience, uh, we've heard a lot of excellent suggestions about what the U.S. uh, should do going forward. I hope that uh, policymakers are thinking about this as they are trying to decide uh, what's going to be the best way to raise productivity in the United States, to help employment, to raise wages, 
uh, and make us prepared for the industries of the 21st century. I want to thank my guests uh, for joining us today, Wangjer, Andre, Jeremy, Anna. I want to thank our partners at Stanford, uh, Scott Roselle and his team. I want to thank uh, my co-author of our feature, Ilaria Mazako, who did a great deal of heavy lifting in putting that feature together, which everyone can see on the CSIS website. I want to thank the rest of my colleagues at the trustee chair in CSIS. And to everyone who's watching today, wherever you are, uh, uh, be well. And we look forward to having the next feature uh, from Big Data China issued uh, in the coming weeks. And we'll keep you posted on that and look forward to getting feedback on the work uh, that we've uh, presented today. Thank you all so much and take care.